Good morning, boys and girls. We're getting to a very exciting part of our book, The Ghost of Fossil Glen. And we had left Allie with uh, Mr. Henry's dog, Hoover, and she had dug up part of Lucy Stiles' sleeve and something that was long, thin, and white with knobby ends and dropped it proudly at Allie's feet. Chapter 24. Allie was standing there staring with fascination, fascinated loathing at the bone when a man stepped out from behind a scrubby willow bush. You're a meddler, aren't you? He said, just like her. With a startled cry, Allie looked up at the figure which had materialized, it seemed, out of nowhere. Although she had never seen him before, she knew who he was. The thin, bristly mustache, the stained yellow teeth were just as Allie described, though he was bigger than Allie had imagined him to be. His face was flushed and sweaty, and he was breathing heavily, as if from exertion. Exertion is movement, uh, like when you exercise, uh, you're exerting energy. He wasn't the classic movie villain he had pictured that morning. He was quite ordinary looking, except for the shovel in his hand. I couldn't let you run everything now. You realize that, don't you? He spoke calmly as if he were discussing the weather, as if he had said, You realize it's raining, don't you? He took a step closer, raising the shovel, held it in both hands like a baseball bat. Memorized, mesmerized by his low, reasonable tone and slow, deliberate movements, Allie stood transfixed. Too late, she realized that he had placed himself downstream from her, blocking any chance of escaping toward her classmates. Vaguely, she was aware Hoover, running with carefree abandonment back toward safety. Raymond Gagney came another step closer. Allie took a step back. Again and again, he moved forward. She moved back in a nightmarish stance. Bringing the shovel over his shoulder, Gagney prepared to swing. The placid, almost pleasant look on his face made his actions almost actions all the more horrifying. He looked like a man preparing to swing a bat in a friendly backyard baseball game. Their eyes were locked. Lucy said that looking into Gagme's eyes was like looking into a deep poison well. Allie could feel herself being pulled into his gaze and down that well. She tore her eyes away, turned, and began to run as he scooped up the shovel, swishing past her head. She ran blindly, splashing through the water, slipping on the loose shell, sinking into the soft, boggy places, running, 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 keeping a few steps ahead of the man, the shovel that came slicing and whistling through the air. Desperately, Allie tried to think. Ahead, she knew, was the old mill site. There, the glen narrowed again, the sides closed in, steep and high, and the stream bed ended at the foot of a magnificent waterfall. It was a beautiful and deadly trap. Behind her, she could hear Gagme's labor labored breathing, punctuated uh, by gro groans as he struggled to keep up. Then they approached the foot of the falls. She heard him chuckle with amusement. "'Where are you going to go now?' he said. She looked back. Gagme had stopped running and was standing, leaning on the shovel, watching her with a curious grin. There was nowhere to go, nowhere but up. Allie reached for the skinny branch of one of the trees that snuggled to grow in the sharp, steep, stony side cliff. Digging in with the to toe of her hiking boot, she hoisted herself up, planted her other foot, and grabbed for a foothold on the root of a hemlock tree. Again, she forced herself up, again and again, slowly scaling the face of the cliff. Looking back over her shoulder, she saw with relief that she was now out of range of the swinging shovel and that Gagme wasn't even attempting to follow her. He stood below her, relaxed and waiting, waiting for her to slip or fall or give up and come sliding down to land at his feet. Grimly, Allie held on, looking above her, to consider her route. Overhead was a relatively flat shelf. If she could reach it, she could rest for a moment and then angle over toward a bunch of weeds and vines that would offer a foothold, a handhold. Beyond that, she didn't know. She'd deal with it when the time came. Grunting with effort, she managed to pull herself up to the shelf. She looked back over her shoulder and was surprised to see how far she had climbed. 
Raymond Gagney was about twenty feet was twenty five yards below her. His smug grin and turned into an annoyed, annoyed grimace, probably from the realization that Allie was going to be more trouble than he had anticipated. With the sound of disgust, he threw the shovel to the ground and started up the cliff after her. Terrified, Allie began to scramble haphazardly toward the tangle of vines. She clutched blindly until her fingers wrapped around a stalk, too frantic to remember to test its strength. She used it to pull herself up. For a moment, the stalk held her weight, and then she felt it slipping right out of the cliff, sending her sliding backward in a shower of dirt and rock. At last, she found a foothold on the shelf again and tried to gather her wits and her courage. Behind her, Gagney was slowly, determined, determinedly, determinedly climbing higher and closer. She had to figure out each hand and foothold. All he had to do was follow the route she had chosen. A sob of terror and frustration rose in her throat. No, she told herself furiously. Don't cry. Don't think about him. You can do this. You've climbed places this steep before. Well, almost as steep. Remember the other day? Pretend you're looking for fossils. Take one step at a time. Test each hand and foothold before you trust your weight on it. Slow down. Don't panic. Don't look back. Keep moving. With desperate concentration, Allie climbed. No thought to her head, in her head behind her next step, and that of the man beneath her. There was no sound except for Raymond Gagney's steady groans and grunts, of his exertion and hers, the occasional shower of loose stones and dirt. Gagney's breathing was becoming more and more labored. Allie, too, was near the point of exhaustion, but she made herself push on. And then, to her utter dismay, she came to a spot where she was stuck. Above her was a sheer blank rock face. There was no place to dig a toehold, nothing to grasp, nowhere to go. Below her, very close, was Gagney, clinging to her fragile position on the side of the cliff. Sorry, the dog's trying to get up. Allie began to sob with helplessness, fatigue, and fear. Gagney was climbing steadily. Soon he would reach her, and then he would do to her what he did to Lucy. Allie closed her eyes and waited. Gagme was very close. She could hear the sounds of his struggle, the scramble of his feet, the clawing his hands on the rock just below her. She imagined that she could feel his hot breath on the back of her legs, and she waited for his hand to close around her ankle. Suddenly, everything was quiet. No breathing, no falling rock, no slipping shell. Allie felt a familiar chill still down her neck. She heard Gagme draw in a sharp breath. No, he cried shakily. No, he repeated in a voice filled with horror. It can't be. Go away. You're dead. No. Next came a long, drawn-out, anguished scream, which seemed to go on forever, but which could not have lasted more than a few seconds, as Raymond Gagney fell more than a hundred feet down the side of the cliff. There was a thud when he hit bedrock followed by an awful silence. He was broken by what Allie only dimly realized was a raw, set, strangled sound of her own voice crying for help. Hang on, Allie. You're going to be all right. Help us on the way. Try not to move. Hang on. I can't. You can listen to me, Allie. You can do it. The voice was Mr. Henry's. It was calm and soothing. And when she thought she couldn't hold on any longer and insisted that she could, and she did. Then more people were speaking to her from the top of the cliff this time. A rope appeared above her, and a man in a safety harness came down with it. He tied the rope around Allie and said, It's all over now, honey. We're going up. It's okay. You can let go. But Allie couldn't let go. Her fingers refused to uncurl from their death grip on the cliff. Her feet wouldn't budge from their desperate, desperate hold on the rock. Finally, her rescuer gently pried open her hands and wrapped his arms tightly around her. Together, they were pulled to the rim of the glen to safety. Allie was carried to a waiting ambulance and placed on a stretcher. Despite her protests, 
that she was really perfectly fine. After she was being loaded into the ambulance, she saw that a crowd had gathered. There were two town Seneca police cars, a fire truck, as well as many trucks belonging to volunteer rescue workers from the neighborhood. One of the policemen walked over and stuck his head inside the back of the ambulance. Do you know the identity of the man at the bottom of the glen, he asked. Allie nodded. Raymond Gagney, she said. Her voice came out dry. She cleared her throat and wet her lips. There's another body, too. It's buried in the side of the cliff. You'll see. It's where Hoover, she's a dog, was digging. Another body? The policeman's eyes widened into surprise. Do you know who it is? Lucy Stiles, said Allie. Lucy Stiles? That sounds familiar. You mean the girl who fell from the cliff some, what, four years ago? Allie nodded again as the ambulance driver appeared at the door. We'll be heading to the hospital now, officer. I'll follow you, he said to the policeman. To Allie, he said, I'll need to ask you some questions after you get checked by the doctor. Just then, Mr. Henry appeared, breathless from running up from the bottom of the glen. I'm her teacher, he told the driver. Okay, if I ride along, get in, let's go. Mr. Henry slid into the seat beside Allie's stretcher. He grabbed her hand, and she looked into his worried face. How are you doing, he asked. I'm really fine, said Allie, and she smiled. I've always wanted to ride in one of these. Mr. Henry laughed and looked relieved, but he soon became serious again. Who was that man, and why were you so far up the glen? I feel responsible for this, Allie. I should have kept my eye on you. Allie shook her head. It's not your fault, she said. I was chasing after Hoover. Hoover, you mean she's the one who led you into this mess? Well, not exactly, she answered. I was in it before, but if she hadn't run off, I, I wouldn't have followed her, and then I wouldn't have known what she dis that she discovered Lucy's body. So if you think about it, it all worked out. Wait a second, Mr. Henry said. Back up. There's another body down there? It's Lucy Stiles. Gagney murdered her. Gagney? Mr. Henry repeated. Raymond Gagney said Allie, Lucy's mother's boyfriend. Gagney was Lucy's nickname for him. And Henry, Mr. Henry's bewilderment, Allie explained. See, I found Lucy's diary. That's how I knew about Gagney. He murdered Lucy, Mr. Henry. It wasn't an accident at all. Above the well of the siren, Allie told a spellbound Mr. Henry the bare facts about Lucy's death. And when she finished, she said, Lucy was a great journal writer, Mr. Henry. When I read her diary, I felt as if I knew her. I bet the two of you would have been good friends, said Mr. Henry. I told you she was special and smart like you. Allie felt her face flushing. To cover her embarrassment, she said, I'm so glad she kept that diary. I mean, it helped me to solve her murder, but also in a weird kind of way, when I read her words, it was almost as if she was talking to me, as if she were still alive. Mr. Henry nodded. That's one reason I've been encouraging you to put your thoughts and dreams down in your journals. Do you keep a journal, Mr. Henry? Allie asked. Sure do, Mr. Henry answered. He started to say something else and then hesitated. Allie, he said, when I first got to you, when you were still hanging there on the cliff, you said something, something I'm wondering about. I did. I don't remember. What did I say? You said, thank you, Lucy. And then I thought I heard you say, for saving my life. Mr. Henry looked puzzled at Allie. Oh, she didn't know what to say. How could she explain to Mr. Henry what had happened on the cliff? Sometimes, Mr. Henry said quietly, when it's difficult to talk about something, it helps to write about it. The way that Lucy did in her diary, Allie said softly. The sounds of the sirens began to fade as the ambulance pulled into the entrance of the hospital. How did you find me anyway? Allie asked. She was curious, but she also needed time to decide how much of anything she wanted to tell Mr. Henry about Lucy's ghost. Are you kidding? Your scream came echoing down the glen and we all came running. As soon as I saw you and the body on the ground, I sent the kids back to school for help. I stayed there with you. That's when I heard you talking. He paused. I'd like to hear the whole story sometime, Allie, about you and Lucy. Allie looked out the window, thinking... Maybe in your next journal entry? Maybe, she said uncertainly. Then looking into Mr. Henry's eager open face, she said, All right, I'll write the whole story, she said with a grin. You, you've you already read the beginning. I kind of thought so, said Mr. Henry, grinning. 
The ambulance door opened and the hospital attendant appeared. Mr. Henry scrambled out of his seat. As Allie was lifted out of the ambulance and wheeled inside, he called. I'm going to wait until your parents arrive, and then I've got to get back to school. I'm afraid to think of what Hoover might be up to. You take care now. I'll see you on Monday. Allie waved. Bye, Mr. Henry. Thanks. In a little cubicle in the emergency room, Allie was examined thoroughly, even though she tried to tell the doctor that she was okay. Despite her scrapes and her sprained ankle, she really did feel okay, except when she thought about being on the cliff with Raymond Gagney. His terrifying scream echoed through her head again and again. Worse, it was followed by the horrifying thump of his landing. But what she thought most were the words Gagney had spoken right before he fell. After the doctor had taken her, her temperature and blood pressure and made sure she could follow a finger with both eyes, he poked her here and there to find out where it hurt. Her parents arrived, breathless with concern. They hugged her over and over and asked the doctor what seemed like a hundred questions. Then the policeman came into the little examining room and asked Allie to tell him what she knew about the bodies in the glen. Here we go again, she thought. Feeling suddenly tired, she said, there's a red leather book in my desk at home that will help to explain everything. Your journal? No, it belonged to Lucy Stiles. It's the diary Mr. Curtis was looking for. His boss is the dead man in the glen. Mrs. Nichols' hand flew to her mouth. Her eyes grew round. What in the world? You knew that man? Her father asked with astonishment. Sort of. She answered. She looked at the expressions of amazement on the three faces above her, took a deep breath, and prepared to tell her story or at least most of it. And that's where we'll start today. On Friday, we will finish our book. Happy Earth Day, boys and girls. See you on Friday.